All right, so we, um, we covered most of Leon Battista Alberti's work. We left off, I left off the, uh, I would say the magnum opus of Alberti's work and to many considered his most important or his most um, highest regarded work, masterpiece work, um, which is Santa Maria Novella, which I'll put the slide up here in a minute, but I want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, I received most everybody's essay. Um, I just want to reiterate how important it is to for everybody to have a submission. Um, I don't like to see zeros. I don't want anybody to earn a zero, uh, not on an assignment and certainly not um, on an exam. And I'm going to just read the, the names of people's people's uh, people from whom I did not receive uh, an essay submission. I believe I've checked my Fresno City College emails. I uh, checked my Gmail, uh, and I believe I've even checked sometimes for whatever reason an email. If I'm checking through um, Office 365, sometimes it'll show up in my Microsoft Office 365, but it won't show up in Canvas and vice versa. So I've checked Canvas as well, and I, I believe there was only one submission that was emailed to me that wasn't submitted on Canvas. Uh, and I did mark that person as having submitted. Uh, in that case, it was it was late, and so there will be a markdown. Now I haven't graded yet. I'm going to be I'm going to try to grade, uh, finish grading tomorrow night. I'm going to finish grading tomorrow night, and I will leave each of you feedback on your essays. I don't know. Um, I, I did just glance at them uh, to see who had submitted and who hadn't, so that I can prepare my list of. Um, names of, of folks who had not, just as a final reminder to get something submitted. And in doing so, I didn't have a chance to read carefully through the essays. But from what I saw, it looked like there were complete responses and some quality writing. So I'm truly looking forward to reading them uh, tomorrow night. It's Sunday night. I'm recording this lecture. Um, and I will give you feedback that I believe will help you uh, on the exam which I believe on Canvas is scheduled for this Thursday. Let me double check. And that feedback is important because the exam is coming up. Yes, it's scheduled for February 2nd, which is this Thursday. The exam, I believe, is going to be, yes. So the exam will be available to you um, really Thursday, uh, Wednesday at midnight. So, um, at the end of the day, Wednesday, 1159 or at 12 AM Thursday morning, the exam will be available for you to take, and you can take it anytime from midnight Thursday to 1159, uh, end of the day, Thursday. So you basically have a 24-hour window to complete the exam. The exam is exactly the same format as the essay. The only thing that will be a little bit of an unknown to you all is that you don't know which four projects I'm going to be selecting. Um, for that, I would say pay close attention to the projects that I have focused on in my lectures to date. Um, it probably should come as no surprise that there will be at least one Brunelleschi project. It probably will come as no surprise that there will be at least two, if not more, Alberti projects. And the fourth project will certainly be one of the projects that I have lectured on to date or including this evening's lecture, which is, th this lecture will be a short one. I don't plan to go more than 30 minutes, 35 minutes probably at the most tonight, 
um, which we're going to finish up with Santa Maria Novella exterior and interior. So including Santa Maria Novella and going back at the four Alberti projects that I've lectured on already and the projects we lectured on in the beginning of uh, humanism, um, Palazzo Vecchio, and then moving on to the Brunelleschi work, um, and Palazzo Riccardi in between. Um, those are the uh, those are the projects that you'll be tested on. Uh, so four projects from that suite of works of architecture will be on your exam. It'll be available Wednesday starting at 11.15 or at midnight Wednesday. Um, and you'll have 24 hours to complete it. And the format will be exactly the same as the essay. And you will have the benefit of my feedback um, probably starting tomorrow night. You will see as I input the grades, you'll probably get an auto notification of some of my comments about your writing and your writing style. Um, so that should help you and prepare for the exam. Okay, let me go to inset and to, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to read the names of the, the, those from whom I have not received an essay. So um, my, the syllabus says, and the agreement I have with my students, and, and your, your, this group is no exception, is that I will accept uh, late work. I will accept late work and I will take 10% off for every class session that it's late. So being that this assignment, the essay assignment, was originally due, I believe, on the 24th. Um, if I didn't collect it on the 24th, uh, if this had been a regular class, it would meet Tuesdays and Thursdays, let's say. Uh, so if it wasn't submitted on Tuesday, uh, Thursday would have been the first class that it's late. Uh, it's actually not a second class session late yet. By Tuesday, it will be late two class sessions. And if I receive it by Thursday, it'll be late three class sessions, uh, which will take 30% off your the grade that you receive, but better than zero for sure. Um, so let me read the names. Um, if you hear your name here, reach out to me. Let me know if you submitted it and I missed it somehow, but it's definitely not on Canvas available for speed grader. If you somehow got it to me in a different format and I happen to miss it, please just point that out to me and let me know. And if not, just be honest and say that you didn't submit it, but you are going to prepare it and email it to me and I will grade it as though I'm, I'm grading it as if I received it uh, the day it was due and I'll just simply take off the points based on how late it is. Uh, Preston Baker, uh, Castiel Castle, Jessica Trujillo, Sarahi Marquez, Donna Orejel Torres, Esmeralda Vasquez, Isaac Robles, Justin Sudith Tanvongse, and J Jada Timmons. I can't read my own handwriting. I think it's J A E D A Jada Timmons. Um, so if you heard your name, I did not receive your essay and I don't have a way to grade it, uh, tomorrow night when I do grading. So please, if you have completed it, get it to me. And if not work on it tomorrow and get it to me before the end of the day. Um, okay. Santa Maria Novella. Full screen. And display. Okay. So we've gone through, through the prior works of Alberti. You've seen uh, Palazzo Ruscioli. You've seen, um, let me just get the names down here. Okay, so we started Palazzo with Palazzo uh, Ruscioli. We looked at the temple, uh, Tempio Malatestiano, which is the um, the bishop for whom it was designed, named after the bishop for whom it was designed. Um, we saw the church at San Sebastiano. We saw the church at Sant'Andrea with the grand Roman arch at the entrance. And finally, we're ending with this one, which is uh, Santa Maria Novella in uh, Florence, Firenze. 
uh, and I'm going to check my vocabulary words because the one also thing I want to do before the end of class and of lecture today is make sure that I've gone through each of these vocabulary words in um, looking at the architecture that we've seen to date. Okay, Santa Maria Novella, 1470. Uh, so at the really towards the, the second half of the 15th century, Cinquecento, uh, Florence, as I mentioned. Uh, Leon Battista Alberti is the architect. Uh, and this is really the first. So like um, all of the Alberti works that we've seen to date, this is really a facade, which is the front portion, the sort of public facing side of the building um, that's planted on an existing basilica. So the building predominantly is there. And Alberti's commission is to basically give it a new front face, facade. The word face comes from the Latin word um, facade. So what I'll, and you'll see pictures when we look at this from a kind of an oblique angle of exactly what I'm saying. In fact, I'll just go there now. So here you see kind of a perspectival view. Uh, really, Alberti's work is to design and build this element, which is added onto the basilica. Basilica, I don't believe is one of your vocabulary words, but on the off chance that um, we, we are not familiar with the terminology, basilica comes from actually Roman architecture. And a basilica was originally uh, like a public building, a court where um, uh, public gatherings would take place. And oftentimes, uh, legal matters would have been resolved in a, in a basilica. And basilica is a, um, just basically a rectangular a rectangular plan uh, building, which um, it can be a double colonnade or a single colonnade, but it's basically just long and linear in orientation, sometimes would have a rear apse on it, but is a very basic, simple uh, geometric form. And you can start to see um, the sort of form of the basilica in this plan. There, you will see a plan of it here in a few minutes. I want to just watch my time. We're at 12 minutes. So I've got about 18 to 20 minutes on Santa Maria Novella, and um, that will round us out for uh, humanism, which is really the first part of chapter 11. Uh, okay, so Alberti's commission is to put a facade on, on this um, building that really was built in the Gothic era and in the Romanesque era of 100, 150 years before Alberti gets a hold of it. As Alberti is doing with his prior works, what he is kind of grappling with and wrestling with is this idea on how to resolve the notion of a tall central volume with a lower volume onto the wings. And as we already know, we can look at this and understand that the proportions uh, relative to the tall to the short relate directly to what's happening functionally behind. Because as you are, your eye should already be starting to see is that this is in plan the central nave portion. And in plan, this represents the side aisles. Okay, so there's a... A uh, few new things that we're seeing in Alberti's vocabulary. And when I say vocabulary, what I mean is uh, characteristic design elements that have subsequently been not only designed, but built uh, under Alberti's supervision, which are his language and his way of communicating with us. Probably one of the most obvious, I'm just going to jump jump in and, and call, uh, point it out right away, are the S-curved volutes. Okay, so the S-curved volutes on either side of the large central bay, or really on either side of the pediment, so these guys here, so these S-curved volutes are Alberti's way of resolving the tall with the short, the transition piece. Okay, as you saw from the second image, you can see the roof line 
or the ridge of the roof line, basically coming in if you were if this kind of line of perspective were to continue, basically what the pediment is doing is hiding the the roof of the basilica behind it, or the pediment is informed by the height of the basilica itself. The volutes on the side are basically just transitional elements, which is Alberti's way of saying, I'm going to move from the tall to the short or to the wings by putting this decorative element that looks as though it's it's um, kind of an expression of what's beyond. But the reality is there is nothing beyond. And it's just his way of jumping from here to here. And you can see kind of in your mind's eye how awkward it would be if there wasn't some sort of a solid matter here. It would look like a tall, spindly element, at least above the entablature, which you should know, we recognize by now, is, is this element here. So on top of the entablature, this thing would have kind of a, uh, almost looks like it might topple over if it didn't have something to um, transition from this upper volume down to the lower volume. So this is Alberti's way of, of kind of addressing that. So that's one. Uh, you see the green and white marble um, uh, band banding, uh, which we originally see uh, start to show up in Islamic architecture. Um, but we also saw it, if you remember, the uh, baptistry one of the places which we identified as the sort of birthplace of the Renaissance. Uh, you'll remember the baptistry uh, had the same um, uh, two-color uh, banding uh, technique. So Alberti is doing the same thing here, except here it's uh, we're, we're using marble to achieve that effect and really accent the pilasters on the wings. So he's using the banding to kind of articulate the end vertical elements that are actually rising all the way up, not only look as though they're holding up the entablature, but actually projecting up even past the, um, the upper um, cornice into the actual entablature. Then Alberti is transitioning those elements to this upper piece by expressing the notion of basically giving the pilasters up in the upper section the same banding look, which basically functions um, to make it look as though it's a trabeated structure. It's not. It, this is not a trabeated structure. It's not a column, a column, a column, and a column supporting this entire horizontal element. In fact, this entire wall is supporting the upper entablature, the horizontal element. But that's not what our eye sees initially. And if we're not focusing and paying attention and kind of honing in as we're doing in these lectures, because we're learning about the sort of architectural um, elements and the significance of them, uh, nine out of 10 people or 99 out of 100 people or whatever, 9,999 out of 10,000 people that pass by this aren't going to do to the close reading or the deep reading that we're doing. And for really those people, when you just kind of glance at it or in passing to the untrained eye when you're looking, what you're seeing is these vertical banding elements giving the effect as though the um, those elements are holding up the upper pediment. Um, so it's really affect uh, that, that Alberti is using in this kind of upper technique. Um, the, um, the solar symbol up in the upper pediment here is uh, known as the Florence uh, solar symbol. So he's kind of giving the architecture, uh, he's sort of grounding it in, in, in local uh, cultural um, context, if you will. So he's basically drawing from uh, who he's building for, which are the Florentines. Um, we talked about the upper green and white pilasters, uh, the frieze here kind of ties the entire thing together. There's a very kind of a clean horizontal transition, which separates the upper portion from the lower section. Uh, we certainly talked about the S-curved volutes, which are his way of transitioning from the high to the low. 
Um, and the really probably the most important thing that I want to highlight and that um, uh, theoreticians and, and architects like to highlight um, in Alberti's work, especially here at Santa Maria Novella, is the use, and this is why we're studying uh, humanism as really the start point of, of the Renaissance, this sort of fascination and interest in the human body and proportion as it relates to the human body, what you will start to see, whether you recognize it or not, is a repetition of the square proportion. These rectangles are effectively made up of two perfect squares stacked on top of one another. And then square and square stacked on top of one another. And the proportion of the vertical of this S-curved volute is exactly in proportion to the horizontal of the S-curved volute. Even the circle here is the primary geometrical element that we're seeing, which is the circle. But our minds are also seeing the square within which the circle is inscribed. And that square repeats itself up here. And really the best diagram of that is this diagram, which comes from the Witkover text, uh, which I talked about in the prior lecture. Um, let me jump real quick. Here we go. This is the diagram that I wanted to point out. So if you kind of do a simple, so the, the left-hand side of this diagram is basically an elevation a drawing of the front face of this facade in detail with all of the articulation of the facade. What we're seeing on the right-hand side being done, and then this diagram is in the Witkover text, what you're seeing on the right-hand side is basically a simplification of those elements such that the articulation is taken away, but the massing and the main geometrical uh, elements are kept together. And you can start to see the repetition of the square, first of all, here, just in the sort of dotting along the entablature. Uh, but you also see the square proportion here, which can then be broken down into one, two, three, four squares. And that repeats to define really the top element. And the top of the pediment, you can see, is directly in proportion to the vertical, this is the lower piece. So the lower element of the facade has a vertical proportion that can be understood by this diagram as being two squares tall. I hope you guys can see that in this diagram. The upper portion has exactly the same dimension. It is one, two squares tall. Now it only gets to that point at, at the center, at the upper point of the pediment or at the ridge line, if you will. But our mind understands that. This is kind of the main principle of humanism is that when we see things, whether we can articulate them or not, or whether we can recognize them, you know, kind of um, overtly or not, our mind is seeing those things. Our mind is seeing that the proportion of the bottom element is in is one to one proportion to the top element. Our mind is seeing this large square sitting on top of this large square and that these two elements on the side are one half of this large square. So you can see this kind of repetition of the uh, square proportion in this facade, which governed the design that Alberti set out to um, to develop in the first place. So what you will often see, and you'll we'll see this more and more often as, as we uh, look at more late work, but we're, and this is the importance of documenting what you are doing as an architect. This is the importance of uh, kind of writing and sharing with the world um, the, the sort of background or the basis to what you're, um, at least for important works, what you're going through as an architect, what you're kind of struggling with. And because Alberti has documented and shared with us the principles behind this facade, or because people have studied his works and his writings, we're able to understand this is basically the start point. Alberti very likely would have started with this kind of framework of the square defining the uh, canvas within which he was going to design 
and then set out to kind of break things down into its constituent parts, not the other way around. Um, although historians oftentimes are post post evaluating the work, the architect who is setting out to do this work is basically starting with the idea of the proportion in the rule system and establishing that as his or her framework to design uh, within. So this is um, this is really why this diagram here is why Alberti's Santa Maria Novella is considered um, his uh, most important work. Okay, so we talked about the columns of the ground plane. We talked about the, um, we, we didn't talk about this, but you can also read one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four vertical bays offset on either side. By the way, here again is the sort of celebration of the Romanness of Alberti's architecture with the repetition of the Roman arch, it, it's not as deep. I would say it's not as even detailed or even um, overarching as it was in some of Alberti's prior work. But I actually think it's found really um, harmonious proportion in relation to everything else. It was, um, I think it's it's Mantua, Sant'Andrea, uh, yeah, Santa, the Sant'Andrea Cathedral at the church in Mantua is the one that has the really kind of tall and deep Roman entryway. And it really becomes the everything of that project. It is the most prominent element of that project, almost to the, um, to the um, detriment of the rest of the facade. Whereas here, he's done it in a very subtle way and actually has kind of kept it within um, the sort of belt course or the banding directly below this upper entablature. And it, I don't know, just seems to kind of fit well in terms of the proportion. Uh, and then that allows, you know, elements like the rose window or this uh, kind of very well, beautifully detailed pediment to shine as elements of their own. Uh, I would say this is not, doesn't read to me as like the most prominent thing, the upper pediment, the rose window uh, or the circular window doesn't read to me as the most primary element. Even the S-curve volutes, which are probably the thing that are the most sort of initially memorable or unique, I would say, about this facade, even they are not like just fighting for our attention and, and, and um, kind of overbearing everything else. Everything seems to be really, really well balanced. And that's a clear, clear objective of Alberti's in the first place. Here's another great view of the front front facade and the bays and the way the side, the doors into the side aisles um, seem to just kind of fit well with the way he's broken down the facade. It's, a, it's his, I would say, his most refined work. There's no question that Santa Maria Novella is Alberti's most refined uh, work of architecture. Uh, before I move to the inside, I wanted to go back to this plan. So really the basilica, play, the, the basilica is a clear, clear, kind of a clean rectangular form is its most common uh, plan orientation. In this case, the basilica does have just a really kind of a small uh, transept um, projection off the nave, which really makes it kind of slightly a cruciform plan. Um, but again, still predominantly, you know, rectangular basilica plan, uh, the nave, the side aisles, as we've talked about these chapels, which I'm going to call your attention to in, in, in a moment, uh, and then the crossing and then the rear, the choir or the rear, uh, chancel, um, is really where the altar is towards the back. And then this is the new sacristy that the Medici family commissions, uh, after the church is built. Okay. Couple things with respect to the interior. So the um, the banding, the green white marble banding, continues in a similar fashion on the inside. But here we have uh, the black and white. So this is the kind of polychrome effect that we saw on the front facade is making its way to the interior, and we're seeing that expression. Uh, as the banding that's really defining the archway. Something very, very interesting. A couple of very interesting things about the interior of this church, Alberti's work here. 
Uh, I think I talked about in the prior lecture about Trump Loy, and we're going to um, definitely learn more about Trump Loy uh, when we get into the high Renaissance and even in the Baroque, which is the literal definition of Trump Loy is the trick of the eye. And so uh, even as early as the Greeks, architects are playing games to kind of achieve desired effects with geometry, with spacing, to kind of trick our eyes, to fool the eye as the, as the term goes. So Alberti is using trompe l'oeil here, and the trompe l'oeil effect that he's using, if you pay close attention, well, I mean, it's hard to tell from these images, but the, in, in all of the interior images that you see of Santa Maria Novella, and I believe, I want to say it's 100 meters from this front facade to the start of the back choir, but it looks a lot deeper. If you look, kind of pay attention to some of the other images that you might find, or even some of these slides, to the interior shots, the length of this central nave looks longer than it actually is uh, dimensionally. And the way Alberti achieves that is the distance between these columns or the column clusters that really support the arches along this colonnade, along this line of columns and along this line of columns, is decreasing as you are graduating or moving through the nave. And by decreasing them, by bringing those columns closer together as you move deeper into the space, when you're standing in the, um, really in the entrance, in the narthex, looking towards the rear, the fact that those columns are, the vertical columns are closer together as they move along gives us the effect of the distance actually being 1 and 1.15 or 1.2 or um, 1.3, kind of a, a greater distance than it actually is to make the cathedral or the basilica look even more grand and um, um, transcending the human scale as, um, as it would ordinarily be perceived if he kept that dimension consistent. So I think that's a very interesting um, uh, kind of a sophistication, uh, again, of Alberti's work. That's, that's, I would say, the first most important thing. The solar symbol, I'm sorry, I refer to it as the Tuscan solar symbol. It's actually the Dominican solar symbol. And Dominicans is the order of um, of Christians that are, um, that this church is built for. So that's the Dominican solar symbol, uh, on the pediment on the, uh, on the front facade. Um, the pulpit, uh, this pulpit here that you see is interesting actually for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's designed by a, um, uh, a well-known architect by this point, Filippo Brunelleschi. So the pulpit was designed uh, probably 20 years, I think I have the date here. I don't have the date here. So Santa Maria is 1470. I believe Brunelleschi designs that pulpit in 1460 or 1450 maybe. Um, so, you, you know, years before, on the Gothic church, as I mentioned, was there before. So uh, they commissioned Brunelleschi to design the pulpit before, 20 or 30 years before they uh, hire Alberti to actually design, redesign the cathedral interior as well as the facade on the exterior that we just looked at. But Brunelleschi designs that pulpit. So this is kind of a culmination of, you know, work from two really of the greatest architects in the history of, of, of our architecture, which is Brunelleschi with the pulpit and obviously Alberti with the, uh, with the main work. Um, wrapping it around on the interior as well as the front facade that we've looked at. But also kind of interesting um, backstory with the pulpit is this is the pulpit from which the Pope who was in command at the time, you guys remember Galileo from your physics classes. Um, was it Galileo or Copernicus? You should look that up. Yeah, so uh, from the from this pulpit, the um, 
the father, who was the um, leader of the church at the time, uh, Father Tommaso Caccini, um, actually it's from this pulpit that he denounced Galileo's um, theory, rejected Galileo's theory that the sun is actually the center of our solar system and the earth and the planets are actually orbiting around the central sun, which was considered a heresy at the time. It was preposterous that somebody would propose that the sun is the center of our of our universe. We are the center of the universe. Our, our human existence is the center of the universe, not, um, not the sun. Uh, and so it's from this pulpit that basically Galileo's uh, theory is considered to be rejected, this pulpit that Bruno Leschi had originally uh, designed. So there's some um, kind of lore associated with that element to the, uh, to the left there in this image, to the left of the nave in this image. Uh, and you get a view of it actually looking the other way towards the uh towards the doors into into the basilica in this slide or in this image uh and then you have this work towards the back um which is the rear chancel or the altar um which has just amazing amazing fresco work amazing detail work here in the um uh in the altar piece um and then the way the rib vaults are adorned with, again, fresco, which is a painting technique that there's, um, we have seen before the Renaissance, but really the notion of fresco, which is basically painting on fresh plaster. So when the plaster is applied to the wall by painting on it while the plaster is still curing, you're effectively um, sort of um, casting the pigment into the material and is making the, the 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 wall the mural, if you will, look much more permanent. If you've seen murals, even driving in and around Fresno, you can kind of tell when sort of paint is applied to a surface. The paint is the sort of super superficial layer. It's it's something that's been applied onto. But with fresco, uh, if you've ever had, had the chance to see uh, fresco up close, you can kind of tell that the pigment is sort of a part of the material. There's a sort of depth to it. It's a, 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 a more permanence uh, to it as well. And so um, the notion of fresco becomes uh, part and parcel with Renaissance. It, it really kind of heightens the, the use of the, the fresco. Uh, and you see an excellent example of it here in uh, Santa Maria Novella. And this is the Tournaboni Chapel. And uh, Giraldao is the artist of the, of the fresco work here. Um, and the last bit that I want to cover with respect to Santa Maria Novella, you can kind of see it here, is, and I believe... No, cloister is not one of your vocabulary words, but it's something that I want you to understand when you see it. Probably the best way to do this would be to take you to Google Maps. Bear with me just a second. Move this here. Okay, so here's Santa Maria Novella. This is the facade and the church that we've been looking at here. And the two kind of last things that I want to call your attention to are this element here to the right, and then there's another similar element there to the left, and that's called a cloister. And a cloister is something that you'll see a lot in uh, religious architecture, and we'll, we'll certainly see more uh, cloisters. We, I may have touched on it a little bit with uh, El Ospedale, um, uh, one of Brunelleschi's work, uh, non, um, non ecclesiastical works. The, if you guys remember, the orphanage uh, has a really beautiful cloister on the inside. The cloister is basically, uh, will, is most, more often than not, will have the, the building itself will be one side of the cloister. 
Um, and it uh, doesn't necessarily need to have four sides, but if it has at least three sides, which are defined by an open edge on one of the um, one of the surfaces, and then there's a line of columns with a roof covering over it, such that somebody can actually walk underneath. So it's closed on one side, open on the other side, and the other and the open side kind of looks onto a semi-private open space. Um, what you're looking at is likely a cloister. So it's basically a place where um, you know a monk or somebody who um, is a part of the the monastic order or the monastery here. It's kind of a contemplative space, a space where somebody can kind of walk around and think and, you know, be in prayer or be in, in contemplation. So there's this beautiful cloister here to the left, and then there's another cloister off uh, to the right of Santa Maria Novella. So that's the another thing that I wanted to call your attention to, because as you can see in the imagery here, Alberti takes the architecture that he's given us for the primary church and has kind of carried that and artic continued that articulation um, onto the cloister on this side as well as the cloister on that side. And you can kind of see it here. You can see the archways defining the column line, and you have this kind of beautiful semi-enclosed, semi-private space that wraps around this lush kind of courtyard um, on the outside. Uh, okay, that's it for Santa Maria Novella, and that's it for Alberti. Uh, we're actually going to move away from Europe onto the Asian continent, with uh, starting with Russia uh, and Ukraine, um, with the next lecture. So I will post the next lecture, but um, really start focusing this week on preparing for the exam that is on Thursday. I probably will post the lecture before Thursday, but if you don't get to it until after the exam, that's perfectly fine. But make sure you uh, review, uh, obviously you're watching this lecture, make sure you review the prior lecture, which is the bulk of Alberti's work leading up to Santa Maria Novella, and obviously the lecture, uh, both lectures from, um, from the prior week in class, which is the start of humanism. Okay, let me know if you have any questions, uh, and I look forward to reading your exams, grading your exam, oh, I'm sorry, reading your essays, grading your essays uh, tomorrow night, and uh, test on Thursday. Thank you.